Are you a praying man? Uh, yes, sir. So we generally start these with prayer, and I, I've had everybody else here pray, but I haven't had you pray. I just wondered if you had just opened this in a word of prayer. Sure. That would be great. Thank you. Father, uh, I'm just coming uh, to know about uh, the deeper truths of the Trinitarian faith. Uh, you have guided uh, our group here across a number of years to uh, to understand the, the Christian life in a more uh, deeper intimate fashion and you you have recently led us into uh, knowing you from the the trinitarian uh, faith and uh, uh, we just continue uh, I guess I'm praying for me on my side mostly, mm. but for all of us, that you lead us and guide us and teach us mm. about uh, this truth of knowing you as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you for the spirit of entering into a great discovery. And this is a, a book that requires some of that spirit of great discovery to it. So. So, Mike, you're down there in New Zealand. Not everybody knows exactly where you are and where you came from. So just give us the, you know, three-line bio as to who you are and how you came to be where you are. Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, so my name's Mike Harbutz. I lecture in theology down here in New Zealand at the bottom of the world. Um, no, you can't drive from New Zealand to America. We were asked that several times when we are in the States. Uh, it's a good uh, 12, 13-hour flight. Um from LA to, to Auckland. Uh, so I lecture at an interdenominational evangelical college of about 1,000 students. Um, I did my PhD on T.F. Torrance in, um, back in 2009. And yeah, a lot of my uh, academic career is around doctrines of the Trinity, particularly pneumatology and how the doctrine of the Holy Spirit affects other doctrines. And... Um, I was attracted to, I don't quite know how uh, or who put me onto Torrance, but uh, it was after my undergraduate, so getting into graduate studies. And then uh, he's never sort of left me in terms of um, using his massive output, and it's huge, as a, a sort of a resource and stimulus for my own thinking and development. Excellent. Thanks, Mike. That help, gets a helpful context. You are also one who's been an advocate for, you know, third article... Um, kind of thinking. Can you just say what that means? Yeah, so because of this interest in pneumatology, I um, started out looking at something called spirit Christology, so an understanding of who Jesus Christ is primarily through his relationship with the Holy Spirit. So I'm convinced that in the Gospels and also into Paul, um, we're, we're led to understand that Jesus is unique, Jesus is the God-man, uh, largely on the basis of his relationship with the Holy Spirit. So it's through his relationship with the Holy Spirit that he is conceived. It's through the relationship with the Holy Spirit that he's baptized. It's through the relationship with the Holy Spirit that he does miracles, that he pronounces authoritative statements, that he raises people from the dead, that he forgives sins. And of course, that relationship means that he's brought into, because he ultimately is, the eternal son of the eternal father. So through the relationship with the Spirit, you get a Trinitarian picture of who God is, as Christ is central to that. After uh, spirit Christology stuff, then my PhD moved into theosis, this Greek word, which uh, means lots of things, but essentially uh, the idea that humans were created to participate in the triune communion in human and creaturely ways. So we never cease to be human, but the glory of salvation is that God has chosen us and created us um, that we can be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, full of the Spirit, and brought into the relationship he has with the Father. You know, no longer do I call you son, uh, slaves, I call you sons, children. Um, we're given the, the spirit of sonship. We're brought into that, that communion. So from theosis, then 
um, looking at broader doctrines, if we took a starting point of the Holy Spirit, like I do in Christology with a spirit Christology, like we might do in salvation or soteriology with theosis or participationary accounts, if we took a starting point with the Spirit into each of our theological discussions, that's what we call a third article theology. Uh, it, it's, it's clumsy language, I, I guess, but it's the Nicene Creed. It's got three paragraphs, three articles. I believe in God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So if we start with that third article, I believe in God the Holy Spirit, it presupposes a Trinitarian um, doctrine, but it asks questions up front, which often either aren't asked at all, or they're left till the very end. We often we often talk about God, we talk about the Christian life, and the Holy Spirit just sort of gets, either mm. we run out of time or gets left off. Mm. Uh, the argument in Third Article Theology is that, um, not 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 unanimously, but, but um, consistently, God reveals himself from the Father, through the Son, by the Holy Spirit. So the first point of contact that creation has with God is through the Holy Spirit, who then immediately brings us into union with Christ, who immediately brings us into the presence of the Father, who sends us back in Christ by the Spirit into the world. So that that Father, Son, Spirit, Spirit, Son, Father. So Third Article Theology wants to take that seriously and say, if we start with where God meets us in embodied real existence, in real lives, that's that's a Holy Spirit. That's a spiritual experience. Uh -huh. And then that will lead us to Christ and that will lead us to the Father. So a third article theology looks at each doctrine of the Christian faith and wants to um, not reconceive it. That would be far too grandiose. It's not that our theology is wrong, but wants to enrich, I guess, each doctrine with questions about the Spirit. Uh, I didn't invent the, the third article theology, but I've certainly been, it's, I guess, foremost proponent uh -huh. <clears throat> um, and it's it's a theology and this will come through perhaps well certainly in the the reading guide I did for this chapter at the end um, it comes through as a little bit of a subtle critique in some ways or not so subtle of, of some of Torrance's applications of his theology where he just often refuses to apply theology and I don't think that's a critique of Torrance himself. No one person can do everything, so and he, he wasn't trying to. But I think I think work beyond Torrance, particularly today, 21st century, needs to be far more attuned to the application, the practice, the embodiment of theology rather than simply the ontological, metaphysical, theoretical. That's important, of course, I'm a theologian. But it, it's always embodied in Scripture. And, and I think um, probably from the modern period, Immanuel Kant and others, we've probably, we're still victims of the separation between the noumenal and the phenomenal, between the ontological and the real. And I, and I think we need, to, we need to radically break that down. We don't see that sort of distinction, I think, in Paul or in Jesus. So um, there's a subtle... Um, uh, critique or invitation, I guess. Um, and, and I bring that out a little bit at the end through Simeon Zahl's work. Yeah. Uh -huh. So there's a sense in which Torrance, even though this is in the sixth chapter of the Trinitarian faith, you're suggesting that if we read with appropriate eyes, there's a harmonious way of understanding the work of the Father, Son, and the Spirit. That if we look here seriously at the Spirit, it brings us to know the Son, know the Father, which ultimately leads the work of the Son for the Father, and it comes to impact the life of who we are in the life of the church, the mission of God in the world, that maybe takes more seriously the working out because we've really become um, ingrained in the life of what it is that God's doing. Is that a... Yeah, yeah, and I think every every theologian knows this, so this is not unique, <laughs> certainly to me, and so it's interesting when Torrance uh, originally gave the lectures, the Warfield lectures, which were the genesis of this book, The Trinitarian Faith, um, when he came to publish the book, he, he added the introduction and conclusion. And, and that's really important, he says, because this is the, the frame of worship within which the early church thinks. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he, he, he's, he's, not, he's not ignorant of, of these things. No, no theologian is. Um, we, don't, we don't simply believe stuff and that's good enough. We believe things for a reason. You know, we're in a relationship with God and that relationship 
means that we are um, infinitely inquisitive about who God is because we're in love with him. And we're also um, uh, committed to doing what he says. Now, not perfectly, we know, yeah. we're, we're not till the resurrection. Um, but I think that's why, you know, Torrance says he put those, the intro and conclusion to make it clear. This is not, these are not esoteric bishops of the early church um, faffing around with homoousius versus homoousius and other silly stuff. This is life and death. This is this is real, passionate, embodied stuff. Um, so I, I think he's attuned to that already. Um, my my point is, I think he doesn't actually in his in his substantial work. Uh, he doesn't make those connections really clear. Um, others of us, I think, have to. Yeah, particularly yeah. into our our postmodern contemporary context. People are asking different questions. They need the same substance, but they're asking different questions, I think. Yeah. And the next edition of Participatio after the anthropology one will be on TF Torrance and the Holy Spirit. So yeah. hopefully yeah. we'll pay out play out some of the themes that we're looking at here today. Yeah. So you're saying that you know we're looking at a chapter in a book. It's easy to get caught up in the early life of the church and to think, ah. Oh, He's just dragging us back to a bunch of, of dead people and what that to say, but we should not be stopped by that. We should see something that's vibrantly intended to enrich the worshiping and missional life of the church today as we read this chapter. Yep, absolutely. Yep, absolutely. There's no, um, there should be no theology that is, that is um, anti-relational, if I can put right. it that way. Yeah, we we are, um, and, and this, this is one of the things I like about Torrance's work. Um, he's a Christian doing Christian work. Yeah. Uh, he's not a philosopher thinking about the faith in some detached way. I mean, quite frankly, who is the time for that nonsense? Um, yeah. He's a passionate disciple. And that's the starting point. That's the basis. We are, we are those who are loved by, by God. And, and out of that love for God, we now seek to think really difficult thoughts after God. Um, yeah. It's one of the definitions of theology. It's one of the things I like about Torrance when I read yeah. um, it. You don't always get that impression from everyone you read. Right. Two just notes for everyone. I did post, Mike has done up a handout that we'll be using today as a supplement. So that's posted on the reading group site. So if you want to just open that up or download it or just get it later, that is a thing to do. And also, if you have comments or thoughts or questions, if you want to put those into the chat, we'll try and integrate them as we go along. So, Mike, you've got the summary of the book here, which I asked you to do a nut mail. I'm just going to read a, a nutshell. I'm going to read that out, and then we'll have you comment briefly on that. The Trinitarian faith, the evangelical theology, the ancient church represents a constructive and contemporary account of the Trinity, wherein Thomas Torrance masterfully presents the ancient Catholic consensus on the doctrine of God and develops those themes with characteristic precision and acumen. Creatively working with the Greek fathers of the time, the ancient church, Torrance follows the mind, Buenema, of the Catholic church in constructing an account of the trying persons that, while theologically dense, is not a species of scholastic synthesis, but rather an example of dogmatic theology, Catholic meaning for the whole church, where the biblical and economic witness evangelical takes precedence over theological propositions which you are quoting here from an article that you have written is that true yeah so tendy clark are doing a cornerstones uh, edition of lots of um classic works from the past that they're republishing so when they did the trinitarian faith they include a a critical introduction so i i, I was privileged to write the critical intro for Trinitarian faith. And so that's where this comes from. Um, my attempt to uh, summarize the book, um, situate it within its its history, and then talk a little bit about its significance. Yeah. Excellent. Good. We'll look forward to, to that upcoming work as well. Do you know when that's going to be out? Oh, that was out several years back. I oh, think. that was out several years back. You have a yeah. book that's coming out on Torrance, though, and Evangelicals. When's that one coming out? Uh, yeah, TF Torrance and Evangelical Engagement. Uh, we're just putting the final touches on that now. That will hopefully be out mid-year with Le uh, um, Lexham, Lexham Press. Yep. Very good. Yep. Yep. We might have to have a session looking at that when it comes out to expose people to what, what that looks like. 
Yeah, that, that's that's come together well. It's got about 15, 15 chapters um, from evangelicals across um, uh, England and uh, in America and a few other places like New Zealand. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's good engaging. India. And India, yeah, and it's yeah, very yeah. accessible as well. Yeah. <laughs> that's great. Very good. Well, Mike, I'm going to have you uh, just read the first paragraph on page 191. I like to read the first paragraph at the beginning and the last paragraph at the end. So just read that to get us oriented to T.F. Torrance's own words as he introduces this chapter. Yeah, sure. So he writes on page 191. <clears throat> at the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, the fathers spoke of the Holy Spirit only in the last single sentence. We believe in the Holy Spirit. Brief as this was, it brought into sharp focus the universal emphasis in the New Testament upon the personal and divine nature of the Holy Spirit, who, with the Father and the Son, is both the subject and object of faith, he through whom and in whom we believe in Jesus Christ and are saved. In him God himself is immediately present in our midst, miraculously and savingly at work, and through him God reveals himself as Lord, for God himself is the content of what he does for us and communicates to us. The Spirit is not just something divine or something akin to God emanating from him, not some sort of action at a distance or some kind of gift detachable from himself. For in the Holy Spirit, God acts directly upon us himself. And in giving us his Holy Spirit, God gives us nothing less than himself. Since God is Spirit, the giver of the Spirit and the gift of the Holy Spirit are identical. Thus, in the Nicene Creed, belief in the Holy Spirit is bracketed together with belief in the Father and in the Son as belief in one God and Lord. Very good. Thank you. So if you hear between the lines there, what is he, what is he wanting to make sure that gets corrected? What is the feeling he has that people miss that he wants to really get us aware of so that as he proceeds in that corrective stance, we, we get. So it, 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 in that very brief uh, intro that I gave, I mentioned I, I'm an evangelical lecturing at an evangelical college. So um, I, I tend to speak in an evangelical register. So <clears throat> when I lecture, uh, Introduction to Theology, and then particularly when I do my Trinity course, I, I will typically start with the whiteboard and I'll just ask students, let's fill this whiteboard with answers to this question. God is. Now, go for it. What, what comes into your mind? You know, word association. God is. And holy, powerful, almighty, everlasting, eternal. Um, all these things. Uh, some smart people at the back will talk about omni this and omni that. Yep, fine. We'll put those on the board. When I do this with churches, when I do this with... Um, uh, general church audiences, it takes quite some time before the words Jesus, Father, Son, Holy Spirit get mentioned. Hmm. I did it once and it took over half an hour before they mentioned Father, Son, Holy Spirit. This is reprehensible. Hmm. I can't be any stronger <laughs> than that. Torrance is saying when Christians say God, they mean Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for there is no other God other than a pure philosophical notion, which is nonsense. Mm. So we say God, we mean Father, Son, Holy Spirit. When we say Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we mean the one true God. So that's Torrance's opening gambit. Uh, yeah. He's not alone. Every Christian uh, theologian in the history of the church has affirmed that. And sadly, uh, back in Torrance's time when he was delivering these lectures and still today we need to keep reminding the church this is true yeah god is not first of all a metaphysical entity or idea who is all powerful or everywhere god is first of all the relational being the god of abraham isaac and jacob the god who enters into relationship with us the god who has revealed himself most fully as the father son and holy spirit mm. it's a good place for torrents to start and he's already yeah. done the father of course and he's already looked at the son Yep. So he's, he's established homoousius, they're of the same substance, the same yep. being. Um, now he's making the same affirmation because he says this is biblical. Yeah. Yeah. And next next month we'll be looking at the church, which again, all of that to inform, empower, and give the church its proper place as setting setting that context. 
So Tom Smale wrote a book called The Forgotten Father. The spirit isn't exactly forgotten, though in many churches, the spirit is forgotten. Um, there is something that's missing though, right? I mean, what word would we write? If you were to write a book about the spirit that's missing in the life of the church, you know, what would you call that book? Um, <laughs> I don't know. What would you call it? <laughs> well, there's something call, about- You gotta call it the invisible spirit. <laughs> the invisible spirit, but that's, that's probably true. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's it could be the forgotten spirit, um, particularly in, you know, maybe Presbyterian churches are a bit nervous uh, about the Holy Spirit showing up. Um, I'm going to go over here to a comment of Bruce, Bruce Ritchie's, not some sort of action at a distance, T.F. Torrance bringing in terminology used in the James Clerk Maxwell view of reality. Um, he, he rejected the notion and thinking instead of field theory, but with a Trinitarian theological expression through the spirit. Mm. Yeah. Did you want to say anything else about that, Bruce? No, no, Mike, it, it just the, the, the actual expression, as you know, it is mm. taken straight from that whole era where mm. we're called Maxwell's working out field theory. And I think um, TFT yeah. is trying to translate the notion into Theological hmm. expression and seeing the spirit and God in terms of onto relationship with us and so on. Hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, you know, I mean, you're right. Um, I, it's interesting that you know Pannenberg picks up this field theory idea, and I, I think he does okay with it. But I don't think Torrance would would think Pannenberg's even gone far enough in personalizing. Yeah, that's right. Right. Yeah. So in the introduction here. There is this, uh, you know, a brief look at kind of the language of the Bible and the nature of, of Kadosh and, you know, the nature of holiness and the bar, the nature of word. Um, at the bottom of, of page 192, the Spirit of God is not the emission, emission of some divine force detachable from God, but the confrontation of human beings and their affairs with his own self in which he brings the impact of his power and holiness to bear directly and personally upon their lives in judgment and salvation alike. Now, I know a lot of people who say, I see that on the page, but I don't experience it in my life. And you say, well, do you read the Bible? And they say, yeah, but still I, I read those words about direct and personal engagement. You know, how, what do you say to a person like that? It's a good question, isn't it? Um, and it, again, it, it, it comes up later in um, in the handout right at the end where I I draw on some recent work by Simeon Zal, who, who complains, I think, not unfairly, that um, theology has uh, tended to abstract itself from embodied, mm. actual, practical uh, affairs. And, and he uses Torrance as one of his case studies for someone who absolves himself from talking about such stuff, um, which is interesting. Um, the struggle is we don't want to talk about the Christian life in ways which means the way that I experience it is the way that you have to experience it. Mm -hmm. So you should compare yourself to me, or we all compare ourselves to pastor such and such or bishop, whoever. Um, we've, we've got a lot of that on our TV screens uh, around the world, and it's, it's damaging. And it ends up with the sort of fake it till you make it type Christianity, which is just inauthentic. Um, yeah. And yet, at the other hand, we can't we can't be so afraid of talking about experience that we never talk about it. And then we have generations of Christians who might think it's OK to believe certain things, but not to translate that into action or feeling. And so we, we've got those two poles, if you like. So. I think this is where the church gathered. I'm a Baptist, by the way, Baptist minister, um, and so very congregational. Um, this is where I think the church gathered needs to continue to hear stories from each each of us, not, not simply from the ones at the front. So how do I experience the, the Holy Spirit and God's presence? And then I think that needs to be quickly followed by three or four others who were very different. So um, let me just tell a quick story to hopefully illustrate. Um, years ago, the church I was at, we had a, a men's group. I, I don't like men's groups myself. I find them um, terrible things. Um, typically, you know, a hunter gather a barbecue sort of, and it's, anyway, they can be wonderful. But I committed to this men's group for a year. 
and it had, um, I think I may have been the youngest at the time, I was in my 30s, and the oldest were two men who were in their late 80s, and these two guys were um, people I'd known for a while, a long time, they were they were legends in our church movement, They they'd, um, one had been a missionary overseas, the other had been a missionary all his life uh, back here at home. They were equally godly and, you know, they walked into the room and they had a real gravitas, a real, real, what we would call here mana, a real respect. Um, one guy starts talking about his Christian life and he starts crying because he says, I I've only ever felt the tangible presence of the Lord, I think, three times in my entire life that I could talk about. And yet, he said, I, I know God has been with me my entire life. God is more real to me than anybody else. So I, I've never doubted God's presence, God's involvement. But for him, the experience was um, mundane, can I say, um, primarily mediated through scripture. So God speaks only as he hears him through the words of the Bible. Um, he had a close, intimate relationship with God, but it was... Um, yeah, let's just say mundane, if I can use that. And he started to cry because he was feeling late in life that this was perhaps not enough. Maybe he'd missed out. And this is someone who, I mean, you could write a story of his life. Absolute legend of the faith. The other guy in his late 80s quickly follows. And he, and he gives a testimony where for him, the tangible presence of the Lord is a daily thing. He hears God with his ears. <laughs> He's seen God, he says, with his eyes. The, the complete opposite. Um, no less godly, no less intimate relationship, but um, crudely put, his was almost a supernatural relationship. The rest of us are sitting there looking at these two equally godly um, um, models, and we're like, well, who should we compare ourselves to? <laughs> Which one's the better? And, and, and quickly realize there is no better um, we're just very different. Each of them knew God and God knew them. Each of them had a rich prayer life. Each of them had literally spent their lives in, in dedication to God. And yet their experiences couldn't have been more different. As a, as a reasonably young sort of adult, um, that was just really helpful to me to know, well, my experience of God will be different from theirs. And that's not better or worse. And I, I should feel free to express that in small groups and others. And I should expect that others' experiences will be quite different. Now, theologically, it's all the same. Theologically, the same thing's happening. The Spirit is regenerating us. The Spirit is bringing us to Christ, is conforming us to his likeness in Christ Jesus. Again, we are brought into this relationship, which is filial, where we cry, Abba, Father. So theologically, it's all identical. But experientially, it's just so radically different. That was a really good good help for me that yeah. I didn't need to be embarrassed by my experience of the spirit or the experience of God. It, it that's okay, um, yeah. and I've mine is rather mundane, more the mundane side, um, and my my wife's is more the 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 supernatural side, if we can say that. Um, and so it's good. Yeah, <laughs> it's good to know that. Yeah, it is good, and he's he's establishing right here at the front. You know, carry it through, particularly at the end the word and spirit, that the nature of word and spirit, there is a sense of the address of God and the hearing of that word by the spirit. So to say, you know, the spirit does speaking. I mean, he, he mentions that kind of overtly at the end. But the, the question about then the nature of this direct and personal, um, to what degree should we just be saying it's personal when you can hear in scripture and also reflective out of scripture what it is that the spirit is saying as you've said, in the diverse kinds of ways that you hear it. Yeah, the, there's a, a staple of Reformed theology is that word and spirit always go together. Mm -hmm. You never have word without spirit, and you never have spirit without word. And where you do, you should be worried because you're mm -hmm. into some form of idolatry. And so the spirit does speak most clearly through scripture, because that's where Christ speaks. But this, what Calvin calls this inward testimony of the Holy Spirit, um, which again is experientially very different, but theologically the same, where there's this conviction, this compulsion, this understanding, this, this peace that passes all, all, un, all understanding and all comprehension. Um, and if Christians can't talk about their personal experiences of God, 
then there's something deeply wrong because it's a relationship. And yeah. um, in my evangelical context, um, we should know better, but we've turned a relationship with God into something of a more formal test, I guess. If I believe these doctrinal things, then I'm okay. Um, well, that's partly true, but, but not entirely true. You have to be in relationship, yeah. So I think it's the relational and the, the objective go together, I think. Yeah. So Alan Torrance says, we're going to have a proper pneumatology. It has to be Christologically conditioned. And if we have a proper Christology, it has to be pneumatologically conditioned. Yeah, uh, 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 yeah that's right. That that, and that's why I think spirit Christology just makes so much sense. Um, uh, no, no Christ without spirit, no spirit without Christ. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, the question, you know, if you say the spirit told me to say, are you talking about the spirit of Jesus here? You mean the Jesus who went to the marginalized, the broken, who laid down his life? Or is, you know, what spirit are you talking about here? If there isn't a correlation there, then it's it's going to be problematic. And again, if it's not the Jesus, if it's not the Jesus who the spirit pours out in the church to make them servants. Yeah, and you know to really bring a message that focuses on Christ, but focuses on the self, yeah, then yeah. you probably got something we missed there too. So, yeah, the now, dynamic now, of the Trinity becomes important there. Yeah, it does. Now, Karl Barth is 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 as well known. Um, at the end of his career, nineteen sixty eight, says everything I wrote I could have written starting with the Spirit, and and right. people reading him were like, really? That was unexpected. This is a very <laughs> Christocentrist. Um, what? How? What? What did he mean? And he goes on to say, the reason I didn't do it that way is because the, basically we couldn't hear this. Um, mm. Coming out of, you know, Third Reich, Nazi Germany, coming out of that, that whole period, um, every time we talk about spirit, says, but the Holy Spirit is confused with the human spirit or the spirit of the age, and it's co-opted. And now, in, in Bart's context, we can see why he was reluctant to do that. That made perfect sense. Um, Torrance is a generation, of course, later, we still see remnants of, I think, too much of this in Torrance, uh, particularly near the end of the chapter. Again, we still see Torrance shying away from talking about human experience of the spirit too much mm. for fear. And he makes direct statements in this chapter about this for fear that we will confuse this with with a human spirit or a spirit of the age. Um, I don't think today that's that's an option for us. I don't. I think we can make it clear how human experience um, isn't confused with the Holy Spirit and doesn't need to be set up as a threat towards it. Um, in in the Western world, at least, and I think it's the same in the non-Western world, people aren't wanting. We're told, and I think they're right. They're not wanting first of all arguments. They're wanting first of all relationship. Yeah. That's why I think we start with the Spirit, and we've got nothing to fear out of experience. As long as we're clear very quickly to, to name these experiences rightly, and I think that's where Torrance is helpful, um, to not confuse experience for God, but mm -hmm. God is always experienced, uh, mm -hmm. and so forth. Yeah, so I think we need yeah. to make yeah. these distinctions and be a little bit, um, go a little bit beyond Torrance and certainly well beyond Bart at this point. Is there anyone you've seen other than yourself? Who's done that well? Who's taken that next step beyond? Oh yeah, I, I mean the genre of practical theology, of spiritual theology, um, pastoral theology. That that genre does that really well. Okay. Because that's their their forte. I mean, there there are good and bad <laughs> examples, of course. Um, yeah. What I'm saying is, I think I think systematic theologians need to be doing this more as well. There needs to be right. more hand in glove between systematics and practical. The, right. the sorts of things that Andrew Purvis, for instance, you know, immediately comes to mind, uh, yeah. was doing. Um, Ray Anderson, Michael yeah. Jenkins, you know, th um, that that sort of, yeah, yeah, they're, they're doing yeah. that well. Uh, Simeon Zal seems to be picking up this this type of approach uh, really well. John Swinton. So I think there's a whole raft of them. Ha Harriet Mowat. Um, Sarah Coakley is beginning to do this mm -hmm. in, in her, own, her own way, in her Oh, it's called a systematic theology, but it doesn't bear any resemblance to one. But, um, you know, volume one, God, sexuality and the self, um, where she uses uh, what she calls case studies. So uh, for each of that, where she grounds, she grounds the examples of the theology in lived experience. Mm. Yeah. 
Now, I, I, saying that, I'm not advocating here what I might call a, a, a capital C contextual theology where the context determines content. I'm not, I'm not, right. I don't agree with that. Um, I'm talking about something else. Aff affections would be better than emotions or experience, probably. Mm -hmm. But the religious affections, as Edwards and others talk about, um, we are first of all in a relationship. And then in that relationship, we understand, you know, faith seeking understanding. Um, it's not primarily a philosophical or metaphysical business we're involved with. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, the fruit of the spirit is, in a sense, that outworking of a life that has effective dimensions to it, that have practical outcomes that are loving and joyful and, you know, all those other things that go with it that says there's an authenticity, a validation that the work of the spirit is, is truly a work here. Yep. And, and Torrance is insistent here, you know, God is a personal reality, God is a dynamic event, God is designated by the term Holy Spirit, as Holy Spirit, and God, he draws the same awe, the same adoration as Father and the Son, so he's making uh, a threefold case, you know, it's the same theology in the chapters one, two, three, four, and five, because it's yeah. the same God, but the same God in threefold form, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Richard McIntosh has a comment here. I know that um, Torrance is reading the Father's view in the book. Isn't there a need to read the Gospel, especially Luke, where the manhood of Christ is real, so the work of sanctification and the supernatural is the work of the Spirit? In the earthly life of Christ, have the Fathers, Athanasius and Tertullian, as exception, failed to take the reality of Christ's humanity seriously? Um, we need to ask more questions probably of Richard a bit there because um, just on the surface of that comment no I wouldn't wouldn't think so um, so if we go to I mean, Torrance was particularly influenced by people like Irenaeus and an Irenaean account of human human progress um, progress might not be the right term human development um, and, and so for for Torrance no that wouldn't be true um, Certainly, the humanity of Christ is not undervalued. Yeah, no, I'm not. I'm not suggesting that. I'm suggesting Torrance is is, is better than a lot of the, oh. <laughs> the fathers in, in that way, and and um, that's why I was I was saying that the, the Trinitarian faith is an exposition of the early yeah, church's yeah. view. Um, I suppose I, I'm I'm coming from sort of a charismatic perspective, and um, I wonder how much. Um, in trying to defend the divinity of Christ, the early church struggled to really say with a strong tone that Christ yeah. is is a man working in faith, yeah, obedient yeah. To, to God through the power of the Spirit. Oh, um, yeah, okay. Look, um, I think, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, you, you, I mean, you're, you're right and you're wrong. You're right. Yeah, yeah, it, it's a, there's a valid point there, clearly. Um, I, like, for instance, in, in my book, The Anointed Son, I argue that, I think Athanasius is just brilliant. He's one of the heroes of the early church. But when he comes to talk about the life of Christ, he, he almost takes two or three steps backwards. And I'm like, why did you do that? And it's almost like he's embarrassed about the humanity of Christ, the fragility of Christ, that Christ hungered and thirsted. He's, he's almost docetic at points. He's not a docetist, but it's almost docetic in parts of Athanasius. We don't see that... In his disciple Didymus, the blind, he, he's, he's quite overt about the life of Christ. So Ir Irenaeus is quite quite overt about the life of Christ as a human. So it's not that, yeah, there's a mixed bag in the early church. And it's not that people like Athanasius are docetists, but, but he was really pushing a different agenda at that point. And so when we come to something like spirit Christology I talked about earlier, which is emphasizing how we see the divinity revealed through the life of Christ, the humanity. Um, there are, you know, as Torrance might do, aligned on the good and the bad. There are ones who are really helpful, like like Irenaeus and others. There are ones like Gregory Nyssa and others who are so mystical, it's almost like they, they're almost semi-docetic. Um, and so, yeah, I, you, you have a point, yeah. So on the top of page 193, or just a little bit down, he says it was a decidedly Hebraic approach that characterized the New Testament teaching about the Holy Spirit. And he goes on from there. So at some level, he's laying a foundation for an Old and a New Testament foundation for the nature of what follows. He doesn't spend a lot of time on them. But I mean, just to note that, to what degree do you see Torrance um, emphasizing a Hebraic piece? I mean, the New Testament piece is, is somewhat obvious that he draws much on the quoting 
How do you see Torrance bringing the Hebraic as a foundation for what follows? Oh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a loaded question because I, I personally, I just don't buy into the, the vast narrative that pits Hebrew and Greek ways of thinking against each other. I just don't. I don't, I don't know it. that this is pitted. I think it's informing. I think it's enriching. Yeah. So I think what Torrance is talking about in terms here of the Hebraic way of thinking is that there is, behold the Lord your God, the Lord is one, the Shema. Um, there's one God who enters into relationship. Um, and so the, the identity of God is not changed in the New Testament or today. There's a, an utter consistency in who God is, but there's a progressive revelation. So I think he's He's, he's just locking into the consistent biblical testimony about who God is. The God of the Old Testament is as loving and gracious as the God of the New because they're the same God. The God of the New is as wrathful and just as the God of the Old because they're the same God, if you know. So I think he's made yeah. a case for consistency there, yeah. not necessarily for um, what others. And he does this at times, you know, Hebrew patterns of thinking versus Greek. I know, that, yes, there, there are accents and differences there, but I, I just don't yep. think it's as pronounced as yeah. um, a, a modern theology might think. Right. And so he would wa want to say that the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament is should be seen as utterly consistent with the Holy Spirit in the yeah. New Testament. Yeah. And that the yeah. early church fathers would have been drawing on the depth of all of that. Yeah. So, yeah, and that's where um, the creed and in Torrance, you, know, you get this technical formula, the, the prophets and the apostles. Prophets is Old Testament. Um, and, and so it's a consistent testimony there. Um, he, he does make the point rightly that until the coming of Christ, until Pentecost, we couldn't fully know. The Old Testament couldn't fully understand the Holy Spirit as a distinct person. Um, it, it takes Jesus Christ in the incarnation because Christ is the key to everything. Yeah. So so he's realistic about that, which makes sense. But once we have Christ the key and post Pentecost, we then go back as the early church, the, the first disciples, and we reread the Old Testament and we find the Holy Spirit everywhere, mm. places where we didn't initially find him before Christ. Yeah. So um, Moses stands up, spreads his arms, and a mighty wind separates the, the Um Suf, the Red Sea. Yeah. Um, is this is this a weather report or is this divine action? And if it's divine action, what is this great Ruach that comes and does a work on behalf of God? Uh, are we are we justified to see this is the Holy Spirit um, in the Exodus uh, by pillar of cloud and pillar of fire? They are led through the wilderness, cloud, fire, water. These are all symbols of spirit uh, manifest in the Old Testament. Again, um, I'm not saying there wasn't a cloud and a pillar of fire. What I am saying is, is there something that Torrance would call a depth dimension? Is this the Holy Spirit leading them through the desert? Um, up on Mount Sinai in the great cloud, which is clearly technical in the presence of God, um, Moses is receiving the law on tablets written by the finger of God. What on earth? <laughs> what, what does that mean, right? Um, yeah. Come to the Gospel of Luke, you know, obviously many years later, where a finger of God by this stage has become a euphemism for the Spirit of God. And so so Luke and Synoptics and John use different language at this point, but it's complementary. It, it would argue, you know, many would argue, and I'm one of them, that we go back to the top of Mount Sinai and God wrote the Holy Spirit, uh, the, the, wrote the tablets of the law by his Holy Spirit. That makes sense. Uh, word and Spirit always go together, never separated. Back into the creation narrative. In the beginning, God spoke, um, and the Spirit goes forth, hovering over the waters of chaos, bringing order. Here's a Trinitarian um, reading of that text. Now, the, the, the Hebrews before Christ couldn't have got a Trinitarian reading of it. Post-Christ, doesn't that make sense? And we see this, the early church doing this in a what we would now call a theological interpretation of Scripture, um, looking for valid textual indicators that this is more than just wind or fire or water or oil. Th these are symbols of a, a, a real personal action, God at work. But now, as I say to students, the, the, the use of the word God becomes, um, it's not wrong, but in, in, in discussions like this, it becomes a bit clumsy. 
if it's the triune God we're talking about, we can almost always pass it out. The Father does, the Son does, the Spirit does. One action, but it's it's a personalized action. The Father purposes, the, the, the Son goes forth and achieves, the Spirit perfects, you know, that uh, Basil, language of Basil and others. So yeah. that's what Torrance, I think, is, is picking up here. So yeah. the utter consistency, as you say, from Hebrew to Greek, old to new, yeah. But the new reveals far more than the old conceals. That's right. I, I'm also one that thinks beyond the New Testament. I think God still speaks. I think Christ reigns supreme. He's still talking to the church. The Spirit is inhabiting us. While I don't think we can add to Scripture, that would be, be heretical, I do think that uh, prayer, worship, we receive from God continually. And so um, I think we can do theological readings of the New Testament just as the New Testament did of the Old and, yeah. and see textual indicators that there's more there perhaps than even John or Paul could have seen. Yeah. Todd Norquist says, J.B. Torrance's last day of teaching at Aberdeen, a student remembers exclaiming, the church needs a theology of the Holy Spirit, to which J.B. averred, no, we need the Holy Spirit. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I was that student. That was Bruce there. Nice. Yeah. Do you want to say anything about that, Bruce? You were there. Can you take us back well, there at that moment? Once upon a time, it was in a postgraduate seminar, and I blurted out before thinking much. <laughs> we, what we need is a new theology of the Holy Spirit. And James said, no, we don't need a new theology of the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> nice. I wish... Um, I wish... JB Torrance had have written more for the rest of us who who weren't in his classes could, could have imbibed more of it. Eh? Yeah, indeed. Though there are so there are things other than his writings. There are uh, lectures at Regent. There are audio. Those are of great value as well. So yeah, we can great. still hear by the Spirit what it is that he used JB to say to the church. Um, Howard says James Barr pretty much showed us that a Greek Hebrew divide is mostly a fallacy, um, which may be true though. TF had a hard time with James Barr, so we always have to critique the critiquer and say there's probably a discussion there, which I would argue there's continuity and distinction, that they shouldn't be seen as conflict, but that there are things to be learned from both. It's seeing yeah. more stereographically, kind of. Yeah. And Richard says the creed talk, uh, takes the spirit as the giver of life, not much about resurrection in this chapter, though there is there is some. The connection between the spirit and the resurrection seems to be the key in Paul's theology. Christ, the life, um, oops, it jumped to me. Christ, the life giving spirit, the promise of spirit bodies, which uh, Tom Smale in his book, Reflected Glory, has a whole chapter mm -hmm. on that, yeah. that yeah. very point. Yeah. And Torrance liked Smale and his stuff. Um, oh, he did. I'm doing an article for the, yeah. for that participatio. It's coming up on Tom. Smale and T.F. Torrance on, on the spirit. Oh, Carrie Magruder says, doesn't the question of Hebrew Greek divide depend upon the time and place in each question? Early Greek philosophy is certainly divergent from Hebrew thought in many respects, other than an increasing tendency towards monism. Mm -hmm. Can't wait to read your article. Thank you, <laughs> Carrie. So yeah, this whole question, um, it's important. The thing that I think TF is wanting to affirm at this point is that there is one spirit who has been eternally at work in the Old and New Testament. And so as he begins section one there, it was squarely in line with these biblical convictions about the Holy Spirit that the Nicene Fathers confessed, and he goes on from there. Yeah. So just to say, we, we never should think of, the, of these early church fathers working outside of a careful, attentive uh, focus on the, what it is that is revealed in both Old and New Testaments to bring life to the church and its creedal confessions. So yeah, in, in the in, in section one here, which is basically you know, prolegomena or pre-discussion to the, the third article, um, it, it's interesting. He moves to, to how do we come to this basis of belief in the the lordship of the Holy Spirit? And he he picks out three particular formulae, formulae, as he calls it, for apostolic theology, page 197. The baptismal formula, Matthew 28, and, and you find that everywhere through the through the fathers, right? This is one of the, the key texts, that the singular name of God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in which we baptize. 
the benediction, 2 Corinthians 13, 14. And then interestingly, uh, giver of gifts, uh, 1 Corinthians 12. Um, that one's le less well known, perhaps, as a, as a, um, a primer for this stuff. Three lists, which all start with a different divine person, he notes, showing their equality. So even though we have this general uh, taxis or order, Father, Son, Spirit, the, the, the lists within Scripture and the descriptions of God in Scripture do alternate. They don't always start with Father. Torrance takes this from the Fathers to, to be an affirmation of the equality, the lordship of, of all three, particularly here, the Holy Spirit. One can talk about Spirit, Son, Father, or Spirit, Father, Son. There's nothing, nothing theologically wrong with that, even though it's not liturgically normal. There's nothing theologically wrong with this, and Torrance is making this strong point, I think, that this speaks biblically and then creedally to their, um, to their equality. Uh, he talks about the creed making explicit what's found in the New Testament in early Christian hymns. Um, Homoousius is put on the table here for the Spirit, at least by some of the fathers. Epiphanius becomes one of his key go-tos in this chapter, cited more often than Athanasius in this book, which is interesting. Um, uh, not a really well-known father, to be to be fair, Epiphanius of Salamis. And then later on, down on page sort of 201, um, I find this interesting. He talks about methodologically, pneumatology is derived from, and I think he names four, four sources, biblical statements on page 202. So, you know, as he's just said, there's bibl biblical formula for this. Doxological formula, also on page 202, um, the deposit of faith, which he first brings up on page 199. Um, and, and if you've read other stuff of Torrance, you know, he's got essays and other works around the deposit of faith or the depositum fide, this reasonably simple and then incredibly difficult concept of what it is. That'd be interesting what others in this group think the deposit of faith is. I'd be really interested in that. And then I think the fourth um, area methodologically we get a full pneumatology according to Torrance also on page 202 is what I call positive theologic you know he talks about theological logic so a thinking which is formed and informed by revelation not simply speculative stuff so a, a, a positive theologic um, theological science in a way yeah theological science yeah yeah uh, and then, uh, but I, I put in there, as I say, much earlier, he talks about the deposit of faith. Um, and so I I wrote in, in the introduction, that critical introduction, I'll just read briefly. The deposit of faith, an important concept for Torrance, acts as a guide here with regard to the development of doctrinal orthodoxy. The way in which Torrance understands this deposit of faith uh, by means of Irenaeus especially, and then the way in which it was utilized in pro-Nicene theology, culminating in the Nicene-Constantinopolitan creed, put him closer to an Eastern Orthodox understanding of the place and role of tradition than he is to Roman Catholicism. His is a more synthetic view of the great tradition, which seeks to think with the mind of the church, which he names, which is the mind of Christ. As Torrance sees it, um, I quote, by clarifying the inner structure of the gospel through subordinating its mind to the meaning of the Holy Scriptures and the apostolic mind, indeed the mind noose of Christ, which they enshrined, and by giving that structure authoritative expression in the creed, the Nicene Council had the effect of establishing in a hitherto unprecedented way the primacy of the Holy Scriptures in the mind of the Catholic Church. That, that was from page 127 much earlier. And so I think this deposit of faith idea, which we find in the early church and throughout Torrance's work, is, is quite a powerful impetus here for how he's so insistent on the doctrine of the Trinity. Um, and I, I thought I'd bring that up because, A, I'm interested in how others in the group might understand the deposit of faith and how it works and because this is an idea which I will put money on if I was a gambling man you have never heard in a church service in your life <laughs> um, and yet it's so powerful in the early church and that, that raises questions for me about its legitimacy 
um, and its usefulness or otherwise. So I, I, is that too ambiguous for a, do you want to put that into a discussion question or something? So, I mean, so the question you're raising is to what degree is a de the deposit of faith something that we're understanding out of the Holy Spirit that as the church reflected on the developing nature of the canon, that it came up to say these things we hold to be true about the God who's there. Um, and so we hold these as our statement of faith, not as abstract, but it is a, a summary. It's almost like the creed I and mean, the creed became more formalized at councils, but the, yeah. the nature of the deposit of faith was a reflection, as I understand it, by those who had known, walked with, and who were impacted by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in such a way that there was a sense in which it was something the church held to as a kind of a test that we don't have it written. We don't have it written down, but it is an informing concept. Is that right? Yeah. And he, and he does say in this chapter that this creed, the, the 381, this, this, this is the substance of the deposit of faith, not its entirety, but he does say this is, this is key, but yeah, they are just interested in how, how others have received that idea and whether they make anything of it actually. I find this very hard to communicate to to undergraduate students the importance of this idea in the early church because it's just so foreign to anything they've ever heard in church life. I, I, I wondered if there was any. Yeah, F feel free to chime in, anyone. <laughs> Actually, Mike, uh, is I'm... there is there any any biblical statement? Because I was just looking at concordance. Like, because I was just sitting and it sounds Pauline, the deposit of faith, but like, where is it? Is, is, is there any kind of language to connect that to the apostles directly? Or let's say uh, you can always go, you can always go with uh, the um, uh, pastoral patient epistles in the church as the pillar of the truth. <laughs> no, yeah, true, true. Um, or upon that... this confession, maybe, you know, the, the, the Petrine's confession, maybe I, the words, right? The technical language isn't, isn't mm. there in scripture. No, that 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 would be fear. But sorry, so I cut someone else off there. Was it Timothy? Was it? Were you? Oh yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm very encouraged to hear this. Uh, what you said today. I did not call it the deposit of faith, but I was in a pastor to pastor uh, session I do with another pastor. We go live on Facebook and just talk over questions of the day. Um, and so what was on our topic today was just regeneration. So we were compelled, of course, to talk about the Holy Spirit. Uh, and of course, to talk about Christ and how that really occurred in him, but it, it reaches us in, in, in belief and participation by the spirit. And a lady wrote, well, how, how can I know basically that I have the spirit? And at first, you know, I was a little stunned and overwhelmed at how to answer that. But basically, I said exactly what you have mentioned here about calling it the deposit of faith. I started off with what you call the doxological. I said, you know, it's this God is a relational God. We image this God in Christ when we receive the spirit. So the first thing the way to know is just to be in relationship uh, with him, just to talk to him, to call on him. He talks back and it, how he talks to you, I said, may be very different as how he communicates to others. And I said, of course, we have scripture that becomes our kind of objective point where he meets us. That's his great gift to us uh, and by which he meets us. And then I uh, mentioned the creeds are crucial. Because those are times when the when the church gathers together as one mind and they get down to things they all really agree with, regardless of their differences, they come to these the things that they really agree on that kind of the deposit of faith. I didn't call it that. I forget what I called it, but I mean I'm I'm excited by this conversation because I just had it today and just literally said these things. Of course, in this pastor to pastor in Christ session that we have, we're being positively theological. I mean, we're saying, uh, hey, God loves you. Which God? The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit God. And that's the the deep consciousness that Christ gives us as man. Is it, uh, and so anyway, I appreciate this conversation. I'm going to say overall that I agree, and I must agree because this is what spilled out of me today. And I was surprised to see it happening here. <laughs> Led by the Holy Spirit, hopefully. Yes. <laughs> so thank you. Yeah. Amen. To all you're saying on that. <laughs> and just to add to his list, then that you, I mean, on two or two, you know, to say all of these things, we begin with this with scripture. We walk through the doxological life of the church, the work of the creeds, and all that. And we live today. I mean, using Bart's concept of the revealer, the 
revelation, the revealedness. We live today in a conversation where the revealedness of all of that that has gone before informs a conversation with another pastor or with somebody who calls in. And the revealedness isn't a new thing in a sense, but it is making new that which has been the rootedness of all that has gone before, really going into the very life of the Trinitarian God. Uh, I'm. Yes, Richard. Uh, yeah, okay. I don't just didn't, I didn't know if Mark wanted to respond to your comment. Um, I, I think there is a difference between how the reformers and the sort of the Anabaptist and radical Reformation deal with tradition, that. Um, yeah, and especially evangelicals tend to be very influenced by a sort of radical reformation. If if we were stuck on a desert island with the Bible, we would be able to get everywhere where we've all the theology that we've already got out. Um, mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people, especially, work with that sort of a assumption, don't they? When they they go into things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and I think that's partly what's behind this resurgence, uh, a welcome resurgence of um, small C. You know, Catholic theology. So Baptist Catholicity, for instance, that um, Freeman and, um, um, oh, a friend of mine, his name escapes me. Oh, goodness. Um, anyway, the, the, the Baptist, particularly, you know, because it's the world I'm inhabiting, uh, are getting into this more Catholicity of the faith where tradition has a um, stronger mediating authority. Yeah, yeah. So, Mike, take us on into section two. There are three points within section two. I mean, just give us a little sense of what, what he's trying to establish for us there. Yeah. So, as far as I'm reading it, um, the first God is spirit and the Holy Spirit is God, page 205. So, yeah, language around the, the, the term spirit in an absolute sense to refer to the Godhead, but spirit also as a personal designation for, for a hypostasis. So the difference between ousia, hypostasis, this sort of stuff. Um, and he, he makes some and comments Uzia around... is the very being of, and hypostasis is why I often call the person or the particular. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, th there's some material there if people are interested for... It, it's the... For why TF rejects the, this palamite idea of essence versus energies... He never overtly and directly takes that argument on head on in his work. I, I think because of his close association and friendship with many Orthodox people, but a, a critique of that idea is implicit throughout all of his work. To meet with the Father, Son, Holy Spirit is to meet with very God of very God. So he, he doesn't feel a need for an essence versus an energies distinction. Now, if none of that makes sense to you, don't worry. There is a there's an essay in um, T.F. Torrance in Eastern Orthodoxy. Somebody did write an article on that. I think it was an Orthodox person advocating for a distinction, but it's a careful distinction. At least it would be an outline of what the argument is. Yeah, yeah. And I think I think what they're arguing for really is the what Torrance is and the West is more overt. The difference between the distinction between the ontological and economic trinity, yeah, yeah, right. rather than in essence energies. But anyway, that's a technical thing. Um, yeah. the, in the second, the second part, holy, the Holy Spirit is personal and inseparable from the Father and the Son. So the homoousian, the the same essence and substance of the Son with the Father, has the effect of personalizing the Father in our experience. The homoousian of the spirit with the son, brackets, and the father has the same effect. It personalizes our experience of the spirit. I thought that was a really interesting way for Torrance to argue that, that idea. Um, so there's a consistency again about how God reveals himself as three persons, and they each require the other to be themselves, um, and they each require the other to reveal the other, if that makes sense. That's what's meant by in hypostatic, right? Yeah, that they, yes, they yeah. necessarily need one another to be who they are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and he yeah, he's I, saying here that Jesus is the person. He has said that Jesus is the personalizing person. Here he's going to say that the Spirit is also a personalizing person. I haven't seen him say the Father is a personalizing person, but it would be seem to be implicit within that at some level. That's my argument. It's implicit and required. Yeah. And and while he didn't do it, um, it's utterly consistent if he did. So right. we should. When I do that, I get hammered by um, Latin Trinitarians. 
Um, I don't care, of course, but um, and, and if, if after this, if, if you do look at the, 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 the handout, you'll see I do make some repeated comments, um, particularly here at this point around page 222, that, that at the heart of Torrance's discussion of the Trinity is what I call in my language a relational ontology. This is his onto relations, his perichoretic view. I think it's absolutely right. I think it's biblical and historical, but but many Western Latin Trinitarians don't like it and shy away from it or positively reject it. Um, because? Because they think it's um, too... Well, this, this is a subjective um, critique, right? Okay. I we'll think it because they think it's, it's, too, it's too subjectively personal. And I'm like... And the problem is, <laughs> uh, God is the most personal being there is, of course. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think they fear it makes it could make the three persons individuals. And of course, right. once you do that, you've got three gods, and you're a polytheist. Yeah. I'm not going there. Um, yeah. I don't yeah. believe that is at all what Torrance is doing, and it's not at all what the tradition is doing. And so I make a few few comments throughout that I think Torrance does have this relational ontology. He's clear that. The son derives, if we can use the word derive in a, in a qualified sense, uh, mm -hmm. he talks about things like cause and, and derivation and stuff and qualifies those with the Greek terms. But Eternally the, the, son, so. the son is personed by the father. That's why the father-son relationship is so key in scripture and tradition. Um, and that's why for, uh, I'll just speak for myself, that's why um, I don't think we can replace those those personal names, father and son, with anything else we, we choose. Mother and daughter just doesn't do it. That's not what's been revealed. Right. Um, neither does putting functional creator and savior. Those aren't personal names. Those, those are titles. Those are job descriptions. So why father and son? Why, why, why masculine names? It's not because of anything to do with maleness or masculinity. Um, that, that's got nothing to do with it. Torrance is insistent. Um, but we, we just can't play with those names because the, the, the son reveals the father. And at the same time, the father reveals the son. That's what that relationship speaks. And then the spirit reveals the son as the son reveals the spirit. And the spirit who reveals the son also reveals the father. Because if you reveal the son, you have to have a father. And if you reveal the father, you have to have the son. Do you see what I mean? That there's these mutually circular relationships, if you like. What Torrance doesn't do, but I think it's utterly consistent. The father and the son reveal. Uh, sorry, the, the the son and the spirit reveal who the father is, because in God's being, the son and the spirit equally person the father to the extent that he persons them. Now. A Roman Catholic simply cannot endorse that because the fourth letter in council in 1215 said they can't. Following Aquinas, the father has no origin. Now, I'm a Baptist. I'm not a Roman Catholic, so I don't have to follow the, the fourth letter in council. Um, as I found out when I submitted an article to a Catholic journal and it was rejected because it contravened the fourth letter in council. <laughs> but um, I think that's what scripture is revealing. Um, yeah. You've got... In Torrance's theology, I believe you have three co-equal homoousius in hypostatic persons who are equally the one being of God, such that you can't have one without all three. You can't have two without all three, and you can't understand one without the others. So to the extent that the son reveals the father, I think is also in the economy, in the ontological trinity it's the same thing that the son persons the father you couldn't have yeah. a father who didn't have a son yeah and this is jumping to next week's topic but to the degree that the church is not a personalizing place it is not reflecting the life of the father the son the holy spirit if people don't by the spirit cry out abba father if they don't have a sense of the love of christ for them that awakens a love in them the love of christ compels us and yeah. if the spirit doesn't uh, facilitate or manifest the fruit of the spirit then that church in some way is violating its theology if it doesn't if people don't feel like i've never been more human and more fully myself in discovering the nature of this god in this place what do you think of that 
Yeah, then it's not the true God that they've come into contact with. That's yeah, right. and and to the extent that the church facilitates that, the church is a false church, which of course we all are because we're fallen. So, but that's our that's our critique, right? Um, yeah. We should come into places, churches, the body of Christ, which connects us to the head. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Personally um, and vibrantly. Yeah. Yeah. Bruce, now, Bruce look, has look a if I if I if. if if I crack on a little bit here, under this the second section, he, he talks about the monarchia of God. Now, this is a terribly complex idea. Um, it is. And Torrance has got a lot to say about it here, but also elsewhere, particularly in the agreed statement on the Trinity, which he brokered with, with a pan-Orthodox uh, communion, where he argues that um, the, the monarchy, monoarche, chief head, chief rule, chief cause, is the being of, of God, which is triune, and is only then attributed to the person of the Father. Now that that's highly nuanced, um, but but this is key to his argument, and I think again is modelling what I'm calling a relational ontology. He then gives three excuses. He turns to Didymus, to Cyril, and to Basil's idea of the Spirit as perfecting cause. And what he likes in Didymus, though, uh, this is a little barb here. What he likes in Didymus seems to me what he rejects in his own theology. So there seems to be a little bit of a contradiction here. What he likes in Didymus is that it's an intensely personalized account of the Holy Spirit, where the Holy Spirit can be named, can be worshipped, and can be adored. But Torrance and his brothers, they don't want to do that. They want to name the Holy Spirit. They want to worship and adore the Spirit only in a Trinitarian key, by which I mean only by naming the Father and the Son. They don't want to draw any attention to the Spirit because they think that diminishes who and what the Spirit is and does. Whereas Didymus and, and some others in the early church argue quite the opposite. To the extent that we could worship the Son and worship the Father, to that same extent it's appropriate to worship directly the Holy Spirit. Now, Tor Torrance doesn't like that application of it, which is interesting. Does that include come Holy Spirit? I mean, in, in a worship service, you know, come Holy Spirit and all that follows from that. So, because I'm, you know, I'm, in, I'm really interested in this. So again, Torrance, uh, T of Torrance at least, um, he will allow that, that epiclesis addressed to the spirit in liturgical settings and think that's appropriate but it seems that's all i can find jb torrance is a little bit more open in his worship community trying god of grace he, he's more open to a direct relationship if you like um with the holy spirit um a little bit more open to that that even praying to the spirit that but tf torrance that that would be other than the epiclesis it would seem that would be to take something away from the spirit, I just note that as an interesting discussion. Yeah, what he really, what he's really attracted to in Didymus, he doesn't implement in his own theology. I just thought I'd note that as a, as a, you know, something of interest. And that's then, interesting. Mike, you know, because that's interesting. You put that because, you know, we ask the Holy Spirit for all kinds of things. Is that worship, or do you ask the Son only, or Jesus? Or do you yeah. ask the father? But see, and and so like that that really actually um, you know when when Tom, when Tom's dealing with the supernatural, like when you look at the way he deals with his his little short essay on angels and stuff like that, that was one area there that he he just never never was really connected with, like in in the sense that this personal mm. interaction with the supernatural. Yeah, and the whole yeah. the Holy Spirit is is because we're asking for gifts, and Paul says we need to ask for these greater gifts. We we have to address the Holy Spirit, and even even the Holy Spirit, who if we don't have that Spirit, we cannot speak to those things of God, and it, it, and so we're we're the ones who don't have the appropriate language to address God and the Son yeah. by the Spirit. So we have to have the Holy Spirit give us the language that that's yeah. not just mere analogy, but it actually points to reality beyond this reality. Oh, you, no, no, you, you, you're right, Dwayne. Um, I mean, I, I, when I, talking with students and with church groups on this, um, 
There is a large part of the church that, that, for instance, won't pray directly to the Holy Spirit. They think that's inappropriate theologically. Um, they will pray to the Son or the Father about the Holy Spirit. I don't think that's wrong. So I, I'm not saying that's wrong. A large swathe of the church have done that for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And um, that's their decision. That's fine. Um, <laughs> it's still Trinitarian. And it's still theologically rich. Personally, I think scripture and I think the theology and the theologic here does invite a direct address to the Spirit um, for things like gifts, for if we grieve the Holy Spirit, I think it's appropriate to pray to the Holy Spirit and say, I'm sorry, as it's appropriate to pray to the Father and Son because they're the one God. Um, I'm just making the point that in Torrance's application here, he, he doesn't, he certainly doesn't want or like the prayer directly to the Holy Spirit, but it's no less Trinitarian. It's just a different way of articulating it. I think it's a step backwards. <laughs> um, the, the, the third session, just conscious of time, he talked about the procession of the Holy Spirit, another deeply technical idea, pages 231 to 47, making the point that as with the Son, so too with the Spirit, they're both homoousius of the same being, essence, substance. They're both essentially God, and they are so in hypostatically, so they, they are so personally. And then God is not God without Father, Son, and Spirit. So again, this, this distinctive ontology, even in the procession of the Spirit, comes through. And it's an idea of God that's shared by, by a Catholic mystical theologian, Matthias Schieben, um, back in what, the 1800s. Um, Herobit Mullen, um, Romanian Orthodox, Dimitri Staniloe, and in our Western tradition, um, Thomas Wynandy. I was really interested to see in Khaled Anatolios's recent book, came out about a year ago, Deification Through the Cross, where he overtly picks up on and names T.F. Torrance's Doctrine of God in exactly these ways as capturing a pro-Nicene view of who God is, which has been lost partly in subsequent Western Latin Trinitarianism. And he's, he's trying to reclaim this intensely tri-relational, one being, three persons, three persons, one being, triunity, that idea that Torrance constantly, so we do that so much, we don't start with one, move to three, we don't start with three, move to one, we do both at the same time. It's a bit like, you know, that, that sort of thing. <laughs> we can learn to pat our head and rub our bellies at the same time. We can do two things at once. And so Torrance says we can think one and three, three and one at the same time, because that's what church, that's what liturgy, that's what scripture, that's what the relationship with the God leads us into. So he develops that at some length. It's quite technical. Um, he talks about the filioque stuff. I probably, we probably don't know. Don't know if we want to do that here. I did a whole. There's, uh, there's two, there are two questions there. One from Jordy saying, "Are there New Testament examples of prayer directly to the Holy Spirit?" No, no, they're not. Um, there are no, there are no overt prayers to the Holy Spirit. Um, the only text I've ever seen appealed to, and it's a pretty thin appeal, I do acknowledge. Um, I don't know if this is right or not. Um, don't know what to think actually. But the only text I've ever seen appealed to is "Pray to the Lord of the Harvest," and some have argued that that's the Holy Spirit. As I say, it's a pretty thin argument if that's all we've got to go on. Um, I think it's the Again, I think it's an argument from the trajectory of divine revelation that makes it legitimate. But that's why I wouldn't say you must pray the Holy Spirit, you know, to church groups. No, 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 no. We can agree to disagree on that. As long as in your prayer, your worship and your adoration of God, the Holy Spirit has an overt place that can appropriately be through the Father and the Son. No problems. I just think it's also OK to go a bit further. So I no, would I don't say know also, scripture. The, the nature of, of the question, does the Holy Spirit speak to us? In other words, is prayer a unidirectional thing or is it bidirectional? And cool. so Revelation ends, the Spirit and the bride say, come, let the one who hears say, come, take the water of life, dot cost. Yeah. To just answer that and say, I come, Holy Spirit, I answer your call, yeah. would be a dialogical vision of prayer. So yeah. if we shut and, and up I'm, the Holy Spirit, then we... And I'm looking at this, 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 song that Bruce has put up. This is this is the great irony when I, I talk to church groups or, or students and they're like, no, 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 we're never going to pray the Holy Spirit. 
and you just roll out all these songs we've sung for for, for hundreds of years directly <laughs> praying to the holy spirit and they're great songs oh no that's okay because that's singing you know okay so if it's prayer with music it's okay <laughs> yeah there's so much richness there i think yeah yeah Sounds and, and, like and, what they do with women who you know you can't preach but we'll let you share your testimony or something like yeah, that it's yeah like, yeah what <laughs> yeah 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 and that's so where Timothy, that's where um jb is 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 more flexible at this point i've found in in his limited writings around this particular point and in some of those audios from regent um i think yeah. he was asked this question at one point and far more far more open to, to go in that direction because of the worship dimension i think that you were pointing out bruce yeah right there's a whole, a whole series with jb and jim houston on a trinitarian view of prayer it's probably in that at regent so Timothy asks, if TF, just taking seriously what John wrote in John 16, 13 to 14, as his guide for not focusing too directly on the spirit. Hmm. I, I think the fear is by focusing too directly on the spirit, we are diminishing a focus on the father and son. But that's a false dichotomy. The, how do we know the spirit? Because he's sent by the son or from the father through the son. So if we have the Spirit and know the Spirit, we know the Son because he's the one who makes the Son know it. And same for the Father. So we're more in danger, I think, now as we were in Tom Smale's day of forgetting the Father. <laughs> Remember his, his little book, The Forgotten Father? Um, and and we're, w w what place does the Father play in our theology? It was like what the pendulum seems to just keep <laughs> swinging. And Torrance's appeal repeatedly is let's not do Father, Son, or Spirit. Let's do God in an intensely triune way, all at the same time, which is Father, Son, and Spirit. Um, it's just that he wasn't a technically a pastoral or practical theologian, technically. So he didn't provide those examples. Others have to come along and do that, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so, the, the, sorry, then, then the, the, the third section, which rounds out the, the, the chapter, is the Holy Spirit in the church. Just makes a few comments in the last three pages, 247 to 50. Because in the third creed, third article of the creed, of course, the spirit and the church occupy the same paragraph. And there's a real, um, there's a real sense to that, um, to why that is the case. So really chapter six after this on the church needs to be read, Torrance says, is in conjunction with this one on the spirit. Spirit and church have a certain connectivity there. Yeah. Insofar as the church listens to the spirit. And when it doesn't, then it abandons, in a sense, its task of being a witness to the church. Yeah, And it's and in that it's, third it's, section, he only talks about yeah. the spirit who speaks. Yeah. And so yeah. the speaking life of the church, it is supposed to speak, and people are supposed to listen and speak back, I think. And it is because the spirit has brought the speaking, the heart of the father through the speaking of the son, to give the church ears to hear. But the spirit does speak. I mean, there's he quotes a number of cases here where it talks about what the spirit says to you so mm. to say this the spirit is not silent in jesus vision or the vision of the new testament there is a speaking sense which i just think invites the whole dialogical relational nature that you've been emphasizing seems to be mm. so important yep. uh, throughout and you know just a quick throwback to the question of the filioque to say the father and the son's separates for some people the father from the son torrance is the father through the son by the spirit where you have them in continuity there's a a continuity of conversation that i think he wants to include what it is that the east is trying to affirm that we we cannot see them separate in the nature of what it is that we speak about when we confess so anything that appears to separate the father-son-spirit relationship is problematic and the filioque way can be read in a separating kind of way. So the hope yeah. that TF is holding out is to really unify the church around the triunity of God. That's just a quick kind of yeah. statement on the unity of the voice at some level that's there. Or to and say I there think... are three voices within one, I'm not sure what a unifying voice behind that would look like, but they're harmonic to the degree that they, they work from one will. And that's yeah no that's right and that's that's why this this seemingly esoteric argument that that the the monarchy of the of God is first of all the being and only then the person is so important because it comes into these issues of filioque and others and I do think that agreed statement um, 
I just think that's remarkable, the, the, the theology that's expressed there around the filioque. Um, I, I edited a big fat book on the filioque. <laughs> Not not a big seller because it's pretty technical, but um, yeah, oh, with, with ecumenical perspectives on it, which um, delve into that. Yeah. Now yeah. I was curious that he just at the end on page two fifty brings up the Paraclete, which you know the whole nature of the spirit is the yeah. Paraclete. I'll send another Paraclete. You know, I in classes also say so. Who's the Paraclete? Which people inevitably say the Holy Spirit, and I say when Jesus says another Paraclete, what does that imply? Mm. Oh. Well, maybe Jesus was a paraclete too. It's like, yeah, so what does that mean? Mm -hmm. And so the question, is the father also a paraclete? I mean, it's back to a similar question that we said, which in 2 Corinthians, the beginning there, blessed be the God and Father, the God of all comfort. The word behind comfort there, it's the God of all paracleting. And I think comfort narrows the field to say, so the father who is the God of all comfort comes alongside us in and through the son who by the spirit works in the life of the church. And guess what the church is supposed to do? They're supposed to paraclete other people. Mm. So mm. to talk about the paracleting life, it there's a sense in which participatory ministry that, it, that can't, you can't separate out. You no, know, are we working with the father or the son or the spirit here? Nope, we're, we are involved in and we are being paracleted so that we may come alongside others and guess what? The Spirit and the Son and the Father are all going to be in that very same movement. Mm. So, that, I mean, there's a lot, I think, just in the whole nature of how we think paracletically in the life of the church. <laughs> Paraclete, come, called to come alongside in mm. a way that is coming in the way the Spirit brings us alongside into that. I, th I think what Torrance is... And again, he's not unique because it's deeply Christian. Uh, and so what, what we find here, as we do in any Christian work on God, there's, <clears throat> I'm thinking, you know, uh, Dale, your, your introductory prayer about, um, you know, your, your small group. Um, often it's a hard sell to churches to talk about the Trinity because they say things like, well, we know God really well. I'm just not sure about this Trinity stuff. And you're like, oh. But God is Trinity. Trinity is God. You can't know God unless you know the triune God. Do you know what I mean? And so um, someone like Fred Sanders, who's written a lot around the Trinity, uh, I think makes a really useful point that um, theologically berating people doesn't, doesn't get us very far. <laughs> you should be more doctrinally correct. Um, doesn't really achieve much. But, but living the, a different reality does attract a lot of momentum so what I've found and what I what Torrance here is doing is when we talk about God in mature Trinitarian ways naming the one God who works in a threefold manner as Father Son Holy Spirit it, it's like going from black and white to color from mono to stereo it's the same God but it just deepens everything and then in a relational key it draws us more into um, a, a deeper relationship with not a metaphysical definition of some absolute being we call God. Oh, that's just very unattractive. Um, but into the God who creates, how does the Father create? How does the Son create? How does the Spirit create? They, they do it as one action, but it's a differentiated action. And then if the Father purposes, the Word goes forth, the Spirit perfects, then I talk about that, then I immediately go to something like our our new creation as, as individuals. So me, when I'm newly created in salvation, how was I saved? God saved me. Yep, top marks. But it's not very useful. How does what, what did the Father do in my salvation? What 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 is the Son doing in my salvation? What's the Spirit doing in my salvation? And then we can say this is how God saves. And it just brings a depth dimension to our experience of the faith. And that's why the Doctrine of Trinity is so important, not because we want to pass theological exams, for instance. The more I know God, the more I want to know who God actually is. And he speaks in a threefold form. I am the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. I'm one God and three persons. You'll never understand how that works but I will draw you into this relationship and I want you to respond in Trinitarian ways. So if we think of Eucharist, communion, 
um, again, I'm in a Baptist context, so different people get to officiate that, that communion service. And in other traditions, it's the, it's the priest. But if you're asked to officiate the next four communion services, and, and you're told the first one, I want you to talk about what the Father is doing in the Eucharist. What would you do? What would you say? The second one, I want you to talk more specifically about what the Son is doing. The third one, believe it or not, I want you to talk about what the Spirit is doing. And then the fourth one, I want you to talk about God. And so first one, what well, what the Father sent the Son. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Um, the Father is not immune from the incarnation, even though it was the Son who took on human flesh. Is the Father who journeyed with, etc. So there's a lot we can say about the Father when we come to communion and take the body and blood of Christ. The, the second time we do it around the Son, that's not too difficult, right? We're, we're used to that. The third time, what are we going to what are we going to say about the Holy Spirit? Now we've got things like the Epiclesis, the prayer to the Holy Spirit that come down and inhabit these these elements. But this is this this is the Spirit who back, who 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 um, oversaw Mary. Um, and she was with, with child. This is the, the Holy Spirit who was baptized into Christ and settled upon him in the Jordan. This is the Spirit who throws Jesus into the desert to be tempted. This is the Spirit who brings him back into a ministry which flourishes, which is rich. This is the power of the resurrection, we're told. So there's so much about the Spirit which highlights the work of Christ, which brings glory to the Father, do you know what I mean? So even in, in our central liturgical act of Eucharist, we can talk in deeply Trinitarian ways about what God has done to save us in ways which the congregation aren't getting a lecture on the Trinity, but what they're getting is, and this is where liturgy is so powerful, they're, they're getting a grammar which is going to form their experience so that when they pray and they don't get an answer, they, they, they don't, they don't, they don't give up in the sense, well, God, whoever he is, isn't listening. Well, let, let's just, you know, let's just peel that back a bit. Um, we're talking to a deeply personal God who was invested in us before we were even born or created, who's got plans and purposes for us. And while we might, might not experience in, in anguished prayer all the time an immediate experiential um, result, that doesn't mean we're not actually receiving from God. So Jesus on the cross, my God, my God, why did you forsake me? And I'm of those who read Christ was abandoned at the cross to death. That's, that's the narrative. But he had a confident expectation that he would be risen again. And so it doesn't take away the horror of the cross but it does mean there was an experiential absence. You know, he didn't have the divine voice throughout that whole crucifixion, like a, you know, Life of Brian type Monty Python-esque thing. It's all right, mate, just endure it for a few hours. It'll be over soon. It's, you know, none of this sort of stuff. Um, and so when we journey through our dark nights of the soul and anguish, again, we can pray to this triune God and we don't have to expect immediate emotional experiential although that sometimes that comes awesome but even if we don't get it the holy spirit is so intimately close to us that he will get us through that into the morning if you like where light does come where hope is revealed and for some people that's years some people that's that's most of their life in that dark place that doesn't mean God is absent. That doesn't mean God is not there. That doesn't mean they're an inferior Christian. I, I, I think there are Trinitarian lessons that, that we get that are deeply pastoral and practical and effective. And, and to the extent we talk about God as opposed to the triune God, I think we buy into a, a, a fiction or a bit of a myth. Um, this all-powerful being must do stuff for me. Well, I don't know. That's the God that's revealed. Yeah, yeah. He will Actually, resurrect Mike, us. Yeah. Can I read something here to you guys? <laughs> I was just waiting for you to come along. <laughs> you know, again, the Lord's Supper, I tell you. There, there's stuff there that we miss, because even like we had those conversations, it's been about six years ago now, about a Trinitarian grammar of the Lord's Supper. And we cry, Abba, Father, through the Son, by the Spirit, 
that that it's it's all truly there. But I'm going to read something from page uh, 229, and uh, it's moreover by His presence the Holy Spirit is the place or the topos where men may meet God and are unable to have communion with him, receive his revelation and worship him. And, and that's Deuteronomy 14. You go to the place, the Hashem, you go to the place where the name is placed. And, and that's, the, that's the encounter that we're missing. Because when we're called to assembly, we need to recognize and discern the body of Christ at the Lord's table. And the manifestation of the Holy Spirit is critical at those meetings, if, if you take First Corinthians seriously in, in the early early church, see th this is the work that I've been working on, and that and that's why John um, John's Last Supper discourses are so incredible as bridegroom messiahship because you know he says to Philip, if you if, how can you say show us the Father, <laughs> the I am the I am the Father and the Father's in me, you know, and so this trinitarian grammar is there and this relational reality that is so primary because even it's the mediation of the holy spirit as well like fa the fathers and me like we like because we don't even can apprehend the, the the knowledge of the mediating of the son of god what he does in our humanity taking our humanity and the message gets uh somehow uh you know misrepresented but yeah. but it's it's the apprehension is is the way that we ex we access the love of god we can never comprehend and even in the apprehension, he's always condescending in order to act to us where we're at. And so being both God and man, you know, the testimony is true. And whether we understand it or not, you know, I because I met I have a lot of friends that have been blessed by the spirit to have these gifts been up in the third heavens. And, you know, I pray for that stuff and I prayed regularly for that stuff, you know, not to be a circus freak, but just to get a greater revelation. But, you know, I get revelation sapientially where it's through the spirit. He gives me his mind so I can interpret the scripture or I hear other theologians or other Christians use this language. And all of a sudden it opens up a whole new door of understanding, you know, and, and it's it just everyone's faith is different because the Holy Spirit is so dynamic to deal with all of us. And there's no end because even I was thinking, you know, where we're talking about the spirit. Well, here, let you know, the church is referenced in, the, in Revelation hear what the spirit is saying to the churches the spirit is speaking to the churches directly and participating as the friend of the bridegroom to help get the bride ready for the bridegroom's coming and that uh this personal knowledge is the same knowledge that both the son and the father have and it's in the transmission that we misunderstand the eschatological realities that are hidden from us that we have to ask to receive and properly interpret so you know, this, the Trinitarian grammar at the Lord's table is something that really needs to be worked out. And if, if it's if it's a place where we participate and it's not an end in itself or it is the event par excellence, this side of the wedding supper of the lamb, we can spend all the time that we need at the dinner party, just like Jesus did on that last supper discourse, because he was revealing to them something there that they didn't understand. And, he, and it's even like he says there in John 16, I'm no longer speaking to you in parables. I'm speaking to you in plain language because they had no idea. I am the way, the truth and life. He had, they had no idea where he was going and this stuff. And so it's just, you know, we, we, we just start from where we're at and that, and we cry out the father because the one thing that I'm actually surprised at, if I had a dollar for every time someone actually addressed God as father, I would be a poor man. We, we address the we address God in every other way except Father, and and going back to Mike's point, that's the on the cross. That's the only time that he did not address God as Father, like, so we address him as the Father. And I, and I I mentioned there Ephesians three, where Paul's this great mystery where he's humble. He he bows the knee to confess this God and Father whom every family in the heavenly realms and earthly realms is named. It, it is so. I'm yeah, going to press on. We're just about, about done here. So yeah, I'm done there. Let's just make that comment. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. There's a lot of good wisdom there. I do want to point out Jordy's statement that he talked to Regent this week. There's a 50% discount on um, lectures there at Regent. So uh, that, and he's got the code there that one would get to get those 50% off. And I think that includes the lectures with JB Torrance as well. So, so Mike, I'm going to have you go ahead and read the, uh, the paragraph begins on page 250 with in all his activity. This is kind of the final wrap up of this chapter to kind of see 
to hear TF land plan. Yep. <clears throat> and and um, just slightly before that, if, if, if you do work through the handout and you're interested in any of that critique at the end and commenting, um, I'd be interested to hear any of your comments by, by email um, as I sort of work on a larger chapter around some of the stuff that'd be quite useful. Uh, so you the last email last... or you can post on the reading group too. So you can yeah. include everybody in that conversation. Yep. Go ahead. Uh, so last paragraph in all his activities, the Holy spirit comes to us from the inner commune communion of the father, son and Holy spirit. He is the bond of the Holy Trinity dwelling in the midst of the father and the son, but also the bond of truth and faith who creates unity among us and brings us into communion with the Father, Son and Holy Spirit, into whose one name we are baptised. He is the very life of God himself and is thus the living content of the whole self-giving of God to us through the Son and in the one Spirit. It is then in the Holy Spirit that we have communion or koinonia in the mystery of Christ and are made members of his body. The personalizing, incorporating activity of the Spirit creates not only reciprocity between Christ and ourselves, but a community of reciprocity among ourselves, which through the Spirit is rooted in and reflects the Trinitarian relations in God himself. It is thus that the Church comes into being and is constantly maintained in its union with Christ as his body. This is the Church of the Triune God, embodying under the power of the Spirit the Lord and giver of life, the divine koinonia within the conditions of human and temporal existence. For the church to be in the spirit, in an objective and ontological sense, is to be in God. It belongs to the nature and life of the church in space and time, to partake of the very life and light and love which God is. It is thus an imperative, inherent in the being of the church, ever to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace, and thereby to mirror in itself the oneness of the Holy and Blessed Trinity. And Mike, would you close us in a word of prayer there? I would be happy to. Let me just, uh, let's pray. Dear Holy Spirit, Lord and giver of life, we thank you that you were sent by the Father through the Son, that you might unite us to Jesus, you might open our hearts, open our minds, open our lives to the presence of the triune God, that we might be conformed increasingly into the image of the incarnate Son, that we are brought into the presence of the Holy Father, not as slaves, not as remote people, but as family. We thank you that because you fill us and baptize us, because you immerse us into the divine being, we can pray, Abba, Father, because of the work and person of Jesus Christ. We thank you for all these good gifts. We pray for the future. We pray for the present. We thank you for the past. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, Mike, this has been a truly invigorating conversation. Uh, we obviously have wrestled with these things for years, and we just barely water skied over the top of all that is there to engage. But I think that it really will be um, sparking of great conversations from here. I hope people will engage you as well as continue to engage with this material and with one another. So we thank you for all that you've done up to this point and the time you committed today. And uh, it's pretty early there in New Zealand still, isn't it? Um, nearly midday. No, nearly three. midday. And you've got sun there too. So that's, you know, you're ahead of us with that. So, so anyway, truly thank you for all you are and all you bring to the table. and. Uh, I, we have more more comments today. I think we've had for a while, and we didn't get to all of them. So I don't know if, if some of those can be picked up in further conversations. But um, and at one point we had 25 people online. There's 20 now, but 25 is the most I've ever seen. So you you are a superstar at getting people to come out for the conversation. So thank 25. you. <laughs> uh, thanks, Marty, and thanks thanks everyone. I do uh, you know if you're interested in this topic. Uh, I do welcome and invite um, any, any ongoing conversation. Um, as I say, we're, we're putting this volume, or someone is, I don't know, who's editing this Holy Spirit? Jerome, Jerome Van Koyken is Jerome, um, Jim, yeah. on Torrance and the Holy Spirit. And um, yeah, it's an area that, um, well, 
we need some collective wisdom i think uh, we're better we're better for it so yes. i invite that and thank you yes very good and if people want to get a hold of you do you have an email address that you want to just throw out there for them or oh uh, yeah I'll, I'll, I'll yeah i'll put it in the chat box actually marty that that announcement for the dr houston uh, humanitarian center it's it's actually been announced it's going to be an online lecture you need to get a pass to for free uh january 19th uh, i think it's 12 o'clock to one o'clock pacific time there's right. information that's another that's another lecture but that is also something that's being done at the new jim houston center on yeah it's on the, the theology person. of the person by a doctor i think it's greg Cantor. i think it is the name yeah, yeah. So many good things happening. So Mike's Who's your barber, Mike? <laughs> I like your aerodynamic hair, man. It reminds me of being young. <laughs> I used to walk back. around like a righteous hairdo, no wind resistance whatsoever. I was always moved by the spirit. <laughs> you can't see the M back, M Dwight. There is no hair. <laughs> mhabits at laidlaw.ac.nz. Yeah. For those of you who need that. Good. Well, many blessings on you all. Thank you for showing up today. It's uh, it's always great to be together next week.